Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Book of Acts, a very interesting series of lessons. This is number 11 in that series for September 15 of 2018, entitled Arrest in Jerusalem. Wow, that doesn't sound good, does it? Well, anyway, this is going to be a very, again, provocative and challenging lesson, and we ask to join us in a word of prayer as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow once again, recognizing your presence, recognizing that it is only because of your efforts in preserving these stories and this book for us that we can understand these things about you. Help us to learn what we should learn from these experiences, particularly of the Apostle Paul, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul has arrived back in Jerusalem. He's finished his third missionary journey. He had a lot of forebodings about going to Jerusalem, but he was determined to lead his friends who were helping him to carry a large amount of money to help the church in Jerusalem. He knew that the traditional Jews were absolutely determined to destroy him and his ministry. Some of them had traveled long distances at great expense to try to undo the work he had done. Even the Christian church leaders had serious doubts about his gospel to the Gentiles. The very specific issue, as we have noted before, was the question of circumcision. Should Gentiles be required to become fully Jews, following all the traditional ceremonies, including circumcision, before they could become Christians? So Paul realized that he was traveling into a hornet's nest. Do we have any situations like that in our day, our church? Well, I'll let you think about that. I hope it's not too close to home out there. We can be sure about two or three things. One, Paul had a genuine love for his fellow Jews. That's reflected very well in Romans 9, 1 to 5. Two, he longed to have a church that was unified in its understanding of the gospel. Galatians 3, 28 and 5, 6. Three, he wanted everyone to accept the truth that he had been teaching for years, that Jews and Gentiles, in fact, all men and women, Jackie, there you go, are saved by their relationship to Jesus Christ called faith and not by the works of the law. Romans 3, 28 to 30. And four, Paul believed that the inclusive nature of the gospel meant that real Christians would be drawn together, eliminating all distinctions, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. So look at Acts 21, uh, verses 16 and 17. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and took us to the house of the man we were going to stay with, Manasseh, from Cyprus, who had been a believer since the early days. Manasseh, that's quite a name. So, they knew, they already, by the time they, they got, I mean, imagine you're walking, you're, you're going into Jerusalem, it's time of Pentecost, there's probably a couple million people milling around, and you're walking through Jerusalem with all this money, you would want to have fairly definite plans. You don't want to be standing around on the street trying to guess what you're going to do next. So fortunately, they had made arrangements. The next day, Paul and his friends met with the Jerusalem Christian leaders and handed over to, the, to them the huge collection of money they had brought from the Gentile believers. Look at those verses 18 through 22 of Acts 21. The next day, Paul went with us to see James and all the church elders were present. Which James is this? Brother of Jesus. The stepbrother of Jesus, yes. Paul greeted them and gave them a complete report of everything that God had done among the Gentiles through his work. After hearing him, they all praised God. Then they said, Brother Paul, you can see how many and so forth. We're going to get to that in more detail in a moment. For a few minutes, the Jerusalem Christians found their hearts warm to Paul and all that money. Gary, I think you have something to say about that. Yes. The liberal contributions lying before them added weight to the testimony the apostle of the apostle concerning the faithfulness of the new churches established among the Gentiles. The men who, while numbered among those who were in charge of the work at Jerusalem, 
had urged that arbitrary measures of control be adopted, saw Paul's ministry in a new light and were convinced that their own course had been wrong, that they had been held in bondage by Jewish customs and traditions, and that the work of the gospel had been greatly hindered by their failure to recognize that the wall of petition between Jew and Gentile had been broken down by the death of Christ. Can I interrupt for a second? They were convinced, it says, they were convinced that they were wrong. Why couldn't they admit it? It's called okay. pride. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gary? This was the golden opportunity for all the leading brethren to confess, confess rather, frankly that God had wrought through Paul and that at times they had erred in permitting the reports of his enemies to arouse their jealousy and prejudice. But instead of uniting in an effort to do justice to the one who had been injured, they gave him counsel which showed that they still cherished the feeling that Paul should be held largely responsible for the existing prejudice. They did not stand nobly in his defense, endeavoring to show the disaffected ones where they were wrong, but sought to effect a compromise by counseling him to pursue a course in which their opinion would remove all cause for misapprehension. That's from Acts of the Apostles, pages two, 402 through 403. Wow. Try to imagine being there. Did they sort of slyly look at each other and recognize that they were wrong? And still, they went ahead with their, their with their advice. Was it to save face that they did that? Presumably. Probably, yeah. They do you think they really thought that they were promoting the gospel by doing this? It would it would it would bring the Jews and the Gentiles closer together. Rubbish! That didn't. They knew perfectly well that would not be the result. Well, their prejudice re-arose. In effect, they said to Paul, rumors have been swirling that you have abandoned the Mosaic law and even told Jews not to circumcise their children. Was that true? Yeah. Not at all. What Paul was teaching was that everyone must be saved by faith alone. And there's lots of verses for that. Romans 1, 16 and 17, 2, 28 and 29, Galatians 5, 6, Colossians 3, 11, etc. In his book to the Galatians, written just a few months earlier, Paul had tried to eliminate all distinctions of class, sex, race, and even legal uh, sta status. Look at those verses. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong one. Hold on a second. Um, Galatians 3. I'm going to go to it here. Give me just a moment. You know the famous passage in Galatians 3:28. And 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Did, God, did, did Paul dare to say that to the Jewish leaders, Christian leaders in Jerusalem? You are a descendant of Abraham if you accept Jesus Christ. James, the stepbrother of Jesus, leading the Jerusalem Christians then in effect said to Paul, we want you to observe a traditional Jewish ceremonial custom to prove to the Jewish people that you are still a good Jew. In their view, Paul was advised to be politically correct. Have you heard that term somewhere before? Yes, often. <laughs> He was asked to sponsor a group of Jewish Christian believers who had taken a Nazarite vow and needed to go through a seven-day purification ceremony in the temple in order to complete that vow. Didn't Paul recognize the hazards of spending seven days in the temple in Jerusalem? He must have. He said, for unity, I will do it. In effect, they were asking Paul to reverse his teachings about the gospel. They wanted Paul to say they were 
that there were in fact two Gospels, one for Gentiles by which salvation is by faith alone, and another one for Jews in which salvation was at least partly by works. You would have thought that Paul would have risen up. Well, did Paul try to consult God before he agreed to do this? No. Did he have any opportunity to do so? Is it safe to be politically correct? Brad, I think you have some words about that. Yes, again, um, Acts of the Apostle by Ellen White, 405. Many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were only too willing to make unwise concessions, hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen, to remove their prejudice, and to win them to faith in Christ as the world's redeemer. Paul realized as long as many uh, that so long as many of the leading members of the church at Jerusalem should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work constantly to counteract his influence. He felt that if by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth, he would remove a great obstacle from the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede as such as they asked. Mm. Acts of the Apostles 4 or 5. Wow. Not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. Well, so the question was, did he consult God? Apparently not. Mm -hmm. Or if it, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe the uh, message of truth goes through the filter of our past experience or our prejudices. Well, just like Jesus said, there's so much more I would like to tell you, but you're not ready to understand it. Same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> not easy to go against peer pressure. The closer our peers are to us, the more difficult it is to do so. The time is coming when even family members will turn against us if we maintain our allegiance to the truth. Are we prepared for such an event? Well, Paul had come from recently working among Gentile nations. I mean, he had, I mean, just the fact that he had been to a Gentile nation, he had to go and purify himself before he could even start this vow with these people for seven days. And of course, there's rules about that back in Numbers 19, 11 to 13. So the question I, this lesson really raised in my mind, what possible benefit could, benefit could a Christian gain from taking a Nazarite Jewish vow? Why would they even want to do that? Well, you did. Uh, when I was looking at this, I, it made me wonder a few chapters back where Paul had taken some vow. It, it didn't uh, he had his hair no cut. No detail, yeah. Yeah, he had his hair cut because he had taken a vow. So, but it doesn't say why or what kind of vow or no. or anything, so. Well, that last sentence there, the very first two words, he felt. Yeah. It, he, was, he was running on emotion. He, he was all worked up before he got there all the issues wanting must, so badly, like Gordon yeah. said, to win them over. He must have been terribly disappointed when they came out with that, that re recommendation. He said, look at the table. Yeah. There's piles of money here to help you. Yeah. This came from your Gentile brothers and sisters and the other, you know, far away, people you've never even met. It shows how difficult it, it is to let go of traditions. Yeah. I think uh, as Christians and even as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to look, take a closer look at some of these traditions that may or may not be of God. What do you mean? You mean some of our traditions might not be holy and sanctified? Yes, uh, that's what I'm saying, basically. 
And so Paul was willing to go another step to try and make it work. But he was not authorized by God, is what Ellen White said. Yeah. Well, look at Acts 21, starting with verse 27. But just when the seven days were about to come to an end, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized Paul. Men of Israel, they shouted, help! This is the man who goes everywhere, teaching everyone against the people of Israel, the law of Moses and this temple. And now he has even brought some Gentiles into the temple and defiled this holy place. They said this because they had seen Trophimus from Ephesus with Paul in the city, and they thought that Paul had taken him into the temple. Confusion spread through the whole city, and the people all ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. At once, the temple doors were closed. The mob was trying to kill Paul when a report was sent up to the commander of the Roman troops that all Jerusalem was rioting. Guess who sent the report? We mentioned in our last lesson that Romans, knowing what might happen there in that temple courtyard, had built a high Roman garrison right next to the temple grounds. And they could look down from their top, up the top of their fortress there, and I'm sure there were people constantly keeping an, an eye on what was going in there. They saw this riot starting and they said, we don't know what's going on down there, but it doesn't look good. And they raced down there. Confusion spread through the whole city and the people all ran, I guess I read that. The, um, at once the commander took some officers and soldiers and rushed down to the crowd. When the people saw him with the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander went over to Paul, arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked, who is this man and what has he done? Some of the crowd shouted one thing, others something else. There was such confusion that the commander could not find out exactly what had happened. So he ordered his men to take Paul up into the fort. They got as far as the steps with him and then the soldiers had to carry him because the mob was so wild. They were all coming after him and screaming, kill him. Well, how would you like to be in that kind of a situation? all over false charges. All over false charges. Well, they, they didn't care if the charges were, charges were true or false, whatever. If, they, if it would result in getting rid of Paul or killing him, they would have been delighted. We know now that this, one of these signs has been actually found. There was a low wall separating the outer from the inner court in the temple with numerous warnings in Greek and Latin telling Gentile visitors not to enter the inner temple. If they did so, they would be responsible for their own death. Gordon, I think you've got something about that. From Acts of the Apostles, page 407. By the Jewish law, it was a crime punishable with death for an uncircumcised person to enter the inner courts of the sacred edifice. Paul had been seen in the city of in, in the city in company with Trophimus, an Ephesian, and it was conjectured that he had brought him into the temple. This he had not done, and being himself a Jew, his act in entering the temple was no violation of the law. But though the charge was wholly false, it served to arouse the popular prejudice. As the cry was taken up and borne through the temple courts, the throngs gathered there the throngs gathered there were thrown into wild excitement. Wow. Well, we know they grabbed Paul and began beating him. A riot ensued. Fortunately for us and for Paul, there was a Roman fortress located right next to the temple overlooking the temple compound. The Roman commander, Claudius Lysias, Acts 21, 31 and 32, and 23, 26, had been given a specific responsibility preventing any rioting in Jerusalem, particularly against the Roman government. He rushed down with a group of soldiers and rescued Paul before they could kill him. Paul was bound with chains and taken to the Roman fortress. So, do you think Paul would have survived if he hadn't been there? Probably not. Nope. Claudius Lysias is called the Tribune, in Greek, the Chiliarch. 16 times within Acts 21 to 24. And if you get our handouts, which are available online at uh, Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, 
you could have all these references in front of you. The Greek term kiliarch is said to be used to translate the Roman tribunus militum following Polybius, that was what he called it, and also for the phrase tribuni militaris consolari potestate, or Plutarch, by Plutarch. The responsibilities of a kiliarch were as a commander of a thousand men. Essentially, Claudius Lysias is a high-ranking military officer in charge of anywhere from 600 to 1,000 men, and this appears to be the case for it is said that his, com his command was over a cohort, or a spira, in Jerusalem, which is the tenth part of a Roman legion having about 600 men. So as we know, all of this is based on false rumors. Paul had not violated any of the traditional Jewish requirements. After all, he had once been a member of the Sanhedrin. And what had he done back in the, when we first hear about him? He was doing everything he possibly could to enforce all these requirements, right? Have we ever attempted to pass along damaging rumors, especially about other Christians? Hmm. Or co-workers. How could we do that? I've seen that happen in a lunchroom. Oh boy. People get lathered up about talking about a co-worker. Yep. It's really ugly. Well, this is what happened next. Verses 37 to 40. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the fort, he spoke to the commander. May I say something to you? You speak Greek, do you? The commander asked. Then you are not that Egyptian fellow who some time ago started a revolution and led 4,000 armed terrorists out into the desert? Paul answered, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Please let me speak to the people. The commander gave him permission, so Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand for the people to be silent. When they were quiet, quiet he spoke to them in Hebrew. Wow. It must have grabbed some attention. So, Paul then addressed the Roman centurion in Greek, explaining that he was a Roman citizen from Tarsus and he wanted an opportunity. He was not as a Roman centurion as supposed as the Egyptian. So Paul spoke to the crowds in Hebrew, according to the book of Acts. It may be that he was actually speaking Aramaic, which was the common language of the Jews in Palestine at that time. Um, Aramaic and Hebrew are very closely related. So, but Paul told the story of his conversion when he reached the point where he talked about being sent as an apostle to the Gentiles, suddenly the crowd got riled up again. It is unlikely that the Roman soldiers or the centurion clearly understood everything that Paul had said. So in order to find out the truth, he took Paul inside the Roman fortress and planned to have him examined by flogging. But when Paul mentioned that he was a Roman citizen, they backed off. So. There are several times in the story of Paul where his Roman citizenship was very, very helpful, right? Well, do you think Paul made a wise choice in requesting to speak to the crowd? Well, you never know what, uh, who, you know, with everybody there, they may have, there may have been somebody who uh, heard what happened to Paul and took that to heart. So some might have been actually seriously listening? Maybe. Maybe, you never know. If they had a heart to, uh, like Paul was kicking against the pricks, so to speak, and he mm -hmm. heartily uh, endorsed the stoning of Steed, Stephen, but something, there was a battle going on in his heart, and maybe this is uh, something that might be a seed in somebody else's soul. Well, was it a good idea for, tell, for him to tell his conversion story? Sound like a good idea to you? Well, they listened to it. It was yeah. when he got they got to the he got to the Gentiles. That couldn't he, couldn't he have told the story without mentioning the Gentiles? Well, the the his conversion story though tells of how God reached out and grabbed him and got hold of him. So if God tells me to go to the Gentiles. That's what yeah. I'm going to do. Yeah, but you don't necessarily have to tell the crowd that's there to kill you that you were doing <laughs> something that made them even more want to kill you. <gasps> it was pretty clear to Claudius Lysias that the problem was not something involving the Roman government, but a religious dispute among the Jews. So he decided to take the case straight to the Sanhedrin. 
Great idea, right? <laughs> you think there are any members of the Sanhedrin who still remember Paul personally? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yes. Very likely. Oh, yeah. Very likely. Okay, I think, Dennis, you have some words about that in Acts 23? Acts 23, 1 to 5. Paul looked straight at the council and said, My fellow Israelites, my conscience is perfectly clear about the way in which I have lived before God to this very day. The high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing close to Paul to strike him on the mouth. Paul said to him, God, certainly, uh, God will certainly strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you break the law by ordering them to strike me. The men close to Paul said to him, You are insulting God's high priest. Paul answered, My fellow Israelites, I did not know that he was the high priest. The scripture says you must not speak evil of the ruler of your people. And that's from the Good News Translation. Okay. So can we learn anything about Paul from these uh, words? The first words he said to the council? Well, he was pretty quick to show a kind of den general temperament. Sounds like he might have been fairly quick to express himself. As we know, the high priest was dressed in very traditional clothing. Shouldn't Paul have known that he was a high priest? And obviously he was the head of the council. Many scholars believe that following the blinding of the, on the Damascus Road, Paul's eyesight was never completely normal. So it's possible that he did not see the high priest clearly. Possible. Well, guess what happened next? Acts 23, starting with verse 6. When Paul saw that some of the group were Pharisees, Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, Fellow Israelites, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. I am, I am on, trial here, be, I'm on, on trial here because of the hope I have that the dead will rise to life. As soon as he said this, the Pharisees and Sadducees started to quarrel, and the group was divided. For the Sadducees say that people will not rise from death, and that there are no angels or spirits. But the Pharisees believe in all three. The shouting became louder, and some of the teachers of the law who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and protested strongly. We cannot find anything wrong with this man. Perhaps a spirit or an angel really did speak to him. Wow. So, shouldn't he been let go free at that point in time? Well, I think uh, Ananias, but didn't the Sadducees have the high priest uh, office? Didn't they control that? Sadducees did, yes. Yeah, they were so they were kind of in control. Um, yeah, sort of. To a, to a degree. They were, a, they were a, a smaller group, so there were more Pharisees than Sadducees, but the high priest was a Sadducee. Right. Well, Paul's statement about rising from the dead was not just a clever way of distracting the Sanhedrin for their avowed purpose to destroy Paul. In actual fact, the resurrection from death was the key issue in Paul's argument, Paul's, Paul's gospel, right? Why was that a key issue? That Jesus rose from the dead. Alive and well. Uh, just, just look at Acts 24, verses 20 and 21, for example. Or let these who are here tell what crime they found me guilty of when I stood before the council, except for the one thing I called out when I stood before them, I am being tried by you today for believing that the dead will, be, will rise to life. So he, he knew exactly what he was doing. This wasn't just a happenstance kind of thing. And look at Acts 26, 6 to 8. Now I stand here to be tried because of the hope I have and the promise that God made to our ancestors. The very thing that the 12 tribes of our people hope to receive as they worship God day and night. And it is because of this hope, Your Majesty, that I am being accused by these Jews. Why do you who are here find it impossible to believe that God raises the dead? Well, and he made a very strong point about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verses 14 and following. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. 
More than that, we are shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then, you are, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world. And that Jesus true? Said, and Jesus said he was the resurrection and the life and that, and uh, had taught that uh, those, uh, that he would raise the dead in the, in the final day as uh, Mary, I think, called him on uh, or sa uh, said, recited, and, uh, but he, that's when he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Well, according to Paul, Jesus was alive and well after having been handed over to the Romans, crucified, dying, rising, and returning to heaven. That's a pretty powerful argument, isn't it? That night, Paul was kept in the Roman fortress. In a vision, Jesus himself appeared to Paul with these encouraging words, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified from me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Well, Paul had a plan to go to Rome and on to Spain. Do you think Paul at that point in time, when, when Jesus said that to him, he thought, okay, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to be on my way to Rome. Or did he realize that he might get to Rome in, a, in chains? He was willing to go any way that the Lord chose to send him there. Well, but he had his preferences, of course. <laughs> you mean, especially you, if he wanted to then go on to Spain. Yeah, you think you'd rather travel to Rome as a free man as opposed to traveling to Rome as a as a prisoner? Well, the Roman government will pay your way, and you're protected <laughs> by their soldiers all the way from robbers uh, or whatever. But the Jews were not were not finished. What happened next? A group of 40 Jews hatched a plan by which they felt they could absolutely kill Paul. Look at Acts 23, verses 12 to 17. The next morning, some Jews met together and made a plan. They took a vow that they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. I hope they kept that vow. There are more than 40 who planned this. I shouldn't say things like that, sorry. <laughs> There are more than 40 who planned this together. Then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn vow together not to eat a thing until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the council send word to the Roman commander to bring Paul down to you, pretending that you want to get more accurate information about him. But we will be ready to kill him before he ever gets here. Wow. But then something out of the ordinary happened. What was it? Another spy. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, let me ask a couple questions first. Did these men think that by taking this stand in favor of Judaism and opposed to Paul that they were promoting their chances of being saved in, the, in heaven? Well, they already believed they were saved in heaven because they were Jews. So they just did this because they thought they were supposed to? Yeah. Well, it's pretty clear that in the first century in Judea, revolutionary and nationalistic fervor was common. I mean, well, God provided a surprising way to protect the life of Paul. Now we find out some things about Paul's family that we haven't known about at all at any point up to this point, except the, the implication from the fact that he was a member of the Sanhedrin that he was probably married. So we have implied by that previous experience that he probably had a wife somewhere in Jerusalem, but now we find out what? He had a sister. He had a sister, and the sister had a son. Apparently, Paul and, a, and at least one sister both had been educated and brought up in Jerusalem. Based on this passage, we know that she had married and had at least one son. The way this story is worded, calling the son a Neoniscos, ex uh, well, I suppose we can just look at that really quickly, Acts 23, 18. The officer took him, led him by the, to the commander and said, 
The prisoner Paul called me and asked you to bring this young man to you because he has something to say to you. The commander took him by the hand, led him off by himself, and asked him, what have you got to tell me? So the fact that he took him by the hand, that implies that he was still considered to be a child. This suggests, uh, he might, probably was a teenager, and that he was given permission to go and talk to Paul. When Paul heard the story, he asked that the young boy, may, might, may, the young man, be taken to the Roman centurion with this story. And what happened? Well, they didn't, it was his job not to have riots and 40 men descending on even a, co you know, a company of soldiers to kill somebody was, was not part of the peace. So. <laughs> not part of the Pax Romana? No. So, so, what did he do? He got a whole bunch of soldiers together. Okay. Took them down to Caesarea. Someone has Acts 23. I think that would be Jackie. So here's a letter he wrote. Claudius Lysus to His Excellency, the Governor Felix. Greetings. The Jews seized this man and were about to kill him. I learned that he was a Roman citizen, so I went with my soldiers and rescued him. I wanted now to know... Back? Oh, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Is this the sequence of the real sequence of events, or he's trying to make himself look pretty good here? <laughs> he, he's polishing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> His okay. apple. It, it's true, but he left out a lot of details. Yes, he did. He rescued him first, and then he found out. He yeah. <laughs> he was about to flog him. He didn't mention that. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jackie. Oh. So then I and my... Uh, no, I went with my soldiers and rescued him. Yes. I wanted to know what they were accusing him of, so I took him down to their council. I found out that he had not done anything for which he deserved to die or even be put in prison. The accusation against him had to do with questions about their own law. And when I was informed that there was a plot against him, at once I decided to send him to you. I have told his accusers to make their charges against him before you. Good News Bible. Okay. Was that a, a semi-accurate report of what had happened? Yeah, good pretty enough. good. Pretty, much, pretty good. Yes. So the letter provided Felix with a fair and, and good report of the situation. And what do we know about Felix? He was a scoundrel. And he, he, he didn't mind taking someone's life if it would promote his cause. But as a Roman citizen, Paul had not only the right for fair trial before a local Roman court, but also the right to appeal to Caesar in case he felt it was unfair. We, we know, well, let me just read those verses, Acts 25, 10, 11, and 16. Paul said, I am standing before the emperor's own court of judgment where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you yourself well know. And then verse 16, Then Festus, after conferring with his advisors, answered, You have appealed to the emperor, so to the emperor you will go. So, historically, we know that Felix had a terrible reputation. But in this case, because Paul was a Roman citizen, he was treated fairly. Paul was put under guard, but was allowed to have visitors for the next two years while he was there. Now, I, I, we didn't put this detail in here, but why was he kept there for so long? Anybody remember the story from Acts of the Apostles? I think Felix was thinking that someone was going to bribe him to get Paul out. Felix was hoping for a nice, comfortable bribe, and then he would let go, Paul go. And he kept calling him in, and he would talk with him. And he's, I don't know whether he actually ever actually said, you know, give me a little money and I'll let you go, or whatever. But um, God could have arranged for getting Paul out of prison for those two years. Why didn't he? I mean, he he took Peter straight out of prison, didn't he? Twice. And John. Why did he leave Paul sitting in this Roman prison? away from Jerusalem, two year, probably more than two years. He was communicating with the Christians around him yeah. <clears throat> during that entire time. Yeah. And um, he had an opportunity to do some serious thinking, no doubt. Okay. 
and I think had a very positive influence on those Christians. There's another thing that was happening during this time, almost certainly. I can't prove this, but uh, I'm pretty sure this was true. Luke had come with him all the way from basically Greece, where Luke was, was, was Luke's home, and come with him all the way to Jerusalem. Where did Luke get all the information that he wrote down in his gospel? Well, oh. some of it he, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, the light bulb just went on <laughs> when he asked that question. No, well, so, some of it he would have known because he was with Paul. Yeah. You know, there at, what was but it? Paul Boaz, had not been but, with Jesus either. But before that time, he wouldn't have necessarily known all the, they could have talked any at any time during all these boat rides and things, but... But he, he would have had to ri written it down at some point. Luke did research during this time. Luke did research. And who did he talk to a lot? Women. And his report, he was of course a doctor. He should have had good respect for women. He probably delivered some babies in his day. Well, he did. He went around and in the first two or 300, 400 years of the Christian church, there was such a prejudice, prejudice against honoring women that they, they rejected the gospel of Luke because they thought it was too favorable toward women and marriage. Jackie, what do you think about that? Shocking. <laughs> yeah, it should be. It should be shocking. But the good news is that Luke wrote it. He wrote it. He went around and probably talked to a lot of women. And he clearly, he, and, and, and it's interesting if you, if you read through the Gospels, which Gospel is it tells, that tells us about any of the events connected with Samaritans? Luke. Only Luke, except for one story. There's one story that John involves, five. huh? John 5. John 4. 4? Yeah, John 4, the story of the woman at the well in Samaria and so forth. That's reported by John. But... Any story that, that reflects any good about Samaritans only found in the book of Luke. Mm -hmm. And about women. A lot, any, any, I mean, the thing that talks about, let me just read one. It uh, looks like we've got a little bit of spare time here. Look at, look at Romans, I'm sorry, Acts 8, the first three verses. Luke I'm, 8. I'm sorry, Luke 8 is what's what I meant to say. Luke 8. So not only did Luke write the book of, uh, no, not only Luke. did he write the book of Luke, but it was preserved. Yes. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. Twelve disciples went with him, and none of us should be surprised about any of that so far. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons have been driven out, and who was also a prostitute, we understand. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. How many women were disciples of Jesus? I mean, here is Jesus traveling around with Mormon demon-possessed prostitute and society women, Ex-demon possessed, ex-prostitute. Okay, okay. So, Jackie, what do you think of that story? Well, this is where Paul. This is where Luke got his information. Yes, but in addition, he also had feedback from Paul, who was sure. a prophet, yeah. and God spoke to him directly, and yeah. we have proof of that. But he clearly says he did his research. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you had been an advisor to Paul before this whole business, what would you have cha changed? Paul had determined to take that large contribution from the Gentile believers to Jerusalem. How do you suppose that... Did, did, do you think Paul really thought that when he poured all that money out on the table, 
the Jewish believers would say, okay, Paul, that's, that's enough evidence. Not sure? I think he knew enough about how much they liked money that uh, he thought it would work. How do you think those Jewish Christian believers felt as they, I mean, we read all right already Ellen White's words that, you know, they were temporarily warmed. Well, how do, you, how do you think they felt about all that money after they realized that Paul had been arrested and was, had his life threatened? How would you feel about if you had a personal friend and that personal friend does an enormous benefit to you, gives you a lot of money, and the next thing you find out because you advised him to do something, he's now being arrested and his life is being threatened. But it wasn't him. It no. were those poor people back in Asia Minor that probably didn't have much of anything at all. And they gave them all that money to their brothers and sisters they didn't know. I mean, it should, uh, it should have. Yeah. Well, is it possible that any of those people, any of those Christian leaders were secretly happy that Paul was out of the picture? Wasn't the Christian leader still James, Jesus' bro stepbrother? Yes. Who specifically says so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jim, I think you can tell us. On this occasion, Paul and his companions formally, formally presented to the leaders of the work at Jerusalem the contributions forwarded by the Gentile churches for the support of the poor among their Jewish brethren. The gathering of these contributions had cost the apostle and his fellow workers much time, anxious thought, and wearisome labor. The sum, which far exceeded the expectations of the leaders at Jerusalem, represented many sacrifices and even severe privations on the part of the Gentile believers. It's amazing. These free will offerings betoken the loyalty of the Gentile converts to the organized work of God throughout the world and should have been received by, excuse me, received by all with grateful acknowledgement. Yet it was apparent to Paul and his companions that even among those before whom they had now stood were some who were unable to appreciate the spirit of brotherly love that had prompted the gifts. Wow. In White, Acts of the Apostles, page 399 to 400. Wow. So it wasn't necessarily everybody in the group. But there were some influ well, influential people there who, like, we, like with, with uh, who uh, Peter was drawn off uh, when when those brothers came from from Jerusalem yes. up to Antioch and uh, uh, couldn't hold the line. Uh, do Do we know anything about groups of people that might have joined the Christian Church? particular kinds of people. Let me read you a couple passages. Acts 7, um, I'm sorry, Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Might that have been some of the people? Could who, who would the priests be? Sadducees. Those would be Sadducees. That's not all. Let me read you another place. Look at Acts 15. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, and you wouldn't know this is all about that, that first Jerusalem conference. So it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. They were sent on their way by the church, and as they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God. This news brought great joy to all the believers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders to whom they told all that God had done for them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, 
the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So some of the leaders of the church in the Christian church in Jerusalem were members of what and what? Sadducees and Pharisees. Sadducees and Pharisees. So what we have is two groups. I mean, basically you have Christians who are Sadducees and Pharisees opposed to Christians who used to be Sadducees and Pharisees. Or still were, but had gotten over that. Sadducees would have ex certainly have accepted the resurrection of the dead. They wouldn't have. Well, they wouldn't have you if know, they'd the stayed Bible. as Sadducees. Oh, oh I see. In, in, yeah, in the, the, the Christian, you're talking about the Christian ones. Who right, the ones that were yeah. converted would, yeah. would have certainly uh, changed a lot of what they... Well, had. unfortunately, Paul could not trust, trust even his closest Christian associates. Basically, even the leaders of the church betrayed him. So how would Paul's life have been different if he had not gone to Jerusalem at that time? He would have gone to... Rome and Spain, maybe? Yeah. As a free man? Maybe? Well, is it a good idea to be politically correct? Oh, dear. <laughs> what, what does it mean to be politically correct? Try to fit in with the, the reigning thought. Say what you, it means to say what you think the people want to hear. I wonder why that has anything to do with politics. Hmm. Try to tickle <laughs> people's ears. Yeah. Will it be safe to be politically correct when it's against the law to be a Sabbath-keeping Adventist? No. Well, at that point in time, how should we relate to church leadership? It seems there at that time <clears throat> that even if you were politically correct, somebody would be offended. Yeah. Because they were so divided among themselves. Exactly. Well, in the future, we know that the church organization, as we currently know it, will become illegal and disappear. Why do we say that? They won't be politically correct. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist is official, officially an organization worldwide, 21 million of us now, teaching people to observe, uh, well, to worship God on Saturday. And what's, hap what's going to come? A national and then an international Sunday law. So what do you think is going to happen to the church at that point in time? Our church either going to fold or disappear or and given what if we you if in if is in if what's happened in the past is any hint probably some people will go both ways and there will probably be those there will obviously be a, hopefully a, a good percentage that will say no get out of the organization whatever we're going to stay honest faithful to god but there will almost certainly be some who say well there's, there ought to be some way we can just sort of get along here. And that's happened. It happened in China when the communists moved in. It came, happened in Russia when the communists moved in. Well, being politically correct could be very dangerous, or potentially will be in the future. Well, do you think Paul was actually guided by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem? We read the verse. Now that we've been through all this whole story, how do you think that actually happened? Do you think Paul, the Holy Spirit told him to go and then all the people warned him not to go and he went anyway? What do you think actually happened there? Well, if we needed to know, we would have been told. Mm -hmm. But it seems to say that God was guiding him to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. The only thing that God didn't go along with was the whole cleansing deal he tried to do to make him happy. Yeah, clearly, Ella White tells us that God did not authorize him to compromise as he did with the Christian leaders in Jerusalem. So what if he had stood there with that pile of money on the table and said, Brethren, I'm certain this is not God's plan. 
I mean, I understand. I, I want it. We want to work together, or whatever. But it's not God's plan for me to go to the temple and do that. I just, I just can't agree. And yet, by going to Jerusalem, he challenged the thinking, mm -hmm. yeah. and that was important. Yeah. I mean, certainly it, it must have taught Christians about what that was all about. Well, do we have any challenges that affect us in our witnessing? Always. Yeah. Satan is working to, to uh, combat any uh, dispensation of the gospel. Okay, so here's my next question. Do you think those challenges are more likely to be internal or external? Both. Are they most likely, most li more likely to be our own insecurities, our own failure to, we're afraid to say what we really believe? Initially, and then later, like Paul, uh, the opposition comes more from external, but uh, we, we all have weaknesses, none of us is. Can we go out and just boldly declare the gospel and not worry about being kept safe? God will just take care of us? No. They How hated me, they'll hate you. That's yeah. what Jesus told us. How can we be certain that we're always doing the right thing, the thing God wants us to do? In Paul's case, church leadership was wrong. Has that happened at other times in the history? Well, remember that the so-called church leadership eventually led to the formation of the Roman Catholic Church. Romans 8, 28 tells us that in all things God works for good, and we know what happened in the case of Paul. Paul clearly understood that he had been chosen by God to be an apostle of the Gentiles. Was it was a mistake for him to even return to Jerusalem? Do you think the church leaders in Jerusalem thought that they would promote the unity of the church by asking Paul to do what he did? Well, Paul had said, remember one time, when I'm with Jews, I do this. When I'm with Gentiles, I did that. Is that what he was trying to accomplish? Well, we've been given the challenge of taking the gospel, the three angels' messages to the world. Do you think we can do that to the Muslim world, to the communist world, without stirring up some opposition? No. No way. It's not going to happen. And the devil is behind all of that. So, between you and us, friends, there's challenges ahead. Are we going to be prepared? Are we ready to do what Paul did? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these stories, despite the unfortunate outcomes in some cases, that give us courage to step out boldly and speak the truth for you. May that be our experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.